The blood hasn't only liquidized at these specific times of year when the ritual of prayer is performed, it's happened unexpectedly when it's been removed from the relic case for cleaning or maintenance. Maybe San Gennaro's soul gets confused, he feels a disturbance in the case and is like, oh, get to liquidizing, and then is like, oh, oopsie, it's not time yet. <laughs> I think the Thixotropic hypothesis is possibly slightly more likely than that. It's up to you. Buongiorno, lovely people, my name is Emma. Welcome back to my channel and welcome if you are new. I've just returned from Naples, or Napoli if you prefer, which I do. It was amazing, what a beautiful city. I didn't realise how flat London was until I went somewhere mountainous, it was crazy. I went to the peak Vesuvius, or Vesuvio if you prefer, which I do. My buddy Willow got me this little necklace for my birthday, which is made of lava rock from Vesuvio. I also visited a number of unreasonably decadent and beautiful churches, obviously Italy, predominantly Catholic. You can't walk five feet without bumping into a shrine to Santa Maria or some hidden away, stunningly beautiful Baroque church. It's pretty crazy. If you're interested in religious history, Napoli is the place to go. <laughs> I even witnessed a miracle involving a saint's blood, which is what I'm going to tell you about today. I also got myself the most hilariously tiny Jesus figurine that I could possibly find. He's a little boy. We'll put him over here with Cube Jesus to keep an eye on things. For a tiny bit of background, Catholicism is very physical in that the body is quite important. You'll be familiar with the blood and the wine and so forth, so the best way to be close to a saint is to be close to their physical remains. That is why the physical remains of martyrs and saints are preserved and those are considered relics. First class relics are blood, bones, bodily stuff. <laughs> Flesh is the word. I was reaching for and struggling there. Here's a fun fact for you. The Catholic Church recognises over 10,000 saints, less than 500 of which are women. Go figure. Napoli alone has 52. Hence, there is a monument to a saint on every friggin' street corner. The top dog, or patron saint, if you want to be technical, is San Gennaro. Also known as Saint Januarius, you might have heard that instead. I'm going to refer to him as Jack. Jan? I'm not going to refer to him as Jan, because that's a, a, a random woman's name. I'm going to refer to him as San Gennaro for the rest of the video, but you might have heard Januarius. Same guy. I haven't recorded a video for a couple of weeks, so I've sort of lost my mojo a little bit. Oh, bear with. According to Neapolitan tradition, two glass ampules containing the saint's blood, one which only has a very teeny trickle and one which has a more sizeable amount, that's the one they usually bring out. Those are stored in the Duomo di Napoli, the Cathedral of Naples, where there is a chapel to San Gennaro. I'll throw up a couple of pictures, it's insanely beautiful. On three dates every year, let's see if I can remember them, the 19th of September, the 16th of December, and the first Saturday in May, which is when I was there, the blood is brought out for this ritual. Here comes the local superstition. If the blood is liquefied, it means good fortune for Napoli. If the blood is coagulated, it means bad stuff. When I was in Naples, I visited the San Gennaro catacombs, named for the saint. There's some fascinating history there as well. But the tour guide was telling us all about San Gennaro and his blood, and he gave us some examples of things that happened in the times when the blood didn't liquefy so as to sort of explain the superstition a bit, and those included the start of World War II, the erupting of Mount Vesuvius, an enormous earthquake that killed thousands, and most recently, COVID-19. So people have found a lot of reasons to hold on to this bit of superstition. So as I mentioned, I got to see the liquefied blood. It had turned to liquid just a couple of days earlier when the tradition had been performed, just as we arrived in the country, so... Thank you, uh, San Gennaro. Excuse the language, I can't think of another way to say it right now, but bless this poor chap. <laughs> he looked so bored. I hope they work on his shifts. Your man was just stood there holding up this ampule that was tied around his neck. He had a bodyguard on either side of him and he was behind a little rope partition and he was just standing there holding it up for people to see as people came around and took photos. Every now and then he'd turn it and then turn it back to demonstrate the liquid. <laughs> I imagine after a couple of goes, the excitement wears off pretty quickly, so props to that guy for doing that job. So that's the legend of San Gennaro's blood. Here comes the important question. Is it real? Which is actually too vague <laughs> and bulbous a question that needs to be broken down further. I propose we break the question into two parts. Number one, is this really San Gennaro's blood? Number two, is it miraculous? Short answer, 
Probably not, and no. <laughs> Let's begin with the first question. Now, when I was in Naples, and I was touring San Gennaro's catacombs and learning from the tour guides there and uh, reading information in the churches, a very specific telling of the legendary history of San Gennaro was presented as factual. Again, Italy, predominantly Catholic, there is kind of a vested interest in upholding Catholic history. This is a very important man, the patron saint of Naples. He was a martyr for his faith. So I learned all this fascinating stuff about his life and how he was martyred, how that came about. And then I looked it up myself and discovered that really we know almost nothing about the man or his life. There are only two remaining sources that even mention San Gennaro. The rest of the descriptions of his life come from hagiographies. These are religious texts that are kind of a blend of biography. They do include information about a saint or uh, an important martyr's life, their birth, death, history, the things that they did, mixed with legend, and they are written in a very idolising kind of way. So it's kind of a blend of fact, legend, and heavy exaggeration, which makes them not very reliable if we can't corroborate those with other sources. The earliest reference to San Gennaro we actually still have doesn't refer to his person, but his ghost. This was a letter by the Bishop of Nola in the year 432. The letter is about the death of his mentor, Saint Paulinus, and in it it says that Saint Paulinus had been visited a few days prior to his death by two ghosts, one of whom was San Gennaro. The other was a Saint Martin, but I don't really care about him right now. <laughs> Sorry, Martin. The Acta Bonensia, which I understand as kind of a Catholic journal, mentions San Gennaro and describes him as a bishop of Benevento and a martyr, but this has been dated to no earlier than the 6th century. San Gennaro's death is given as the year 305, so basically, it was ages ago, and the only references we have to his life were from, at minimum, a hundred years after he died. So as I said, most of our information about San Gennaro's life and his doings come from hagiographies. While these aren't reliable texts in terms of one event to another, if they can't be corroborated with other documents, at the very least it is clear that San Gennaro was a martyr for the faith and very, very important to Christians at the time. So according to hagiographies then, Legend has it that San Gennaro's blood was saved immediately after his death by a woman called Eusebia. I'm just going to double check that because I've lost confidence in her name immediately. Yes, Eusebia. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but don't I always. These early hagiographies discuss the moving of San Gennaro's relics to storage outside the city walls, to back to Beneventum where he was bishop, to back into Naples finally. Eventually, they were moved to the territorial abbey of Montevergine, where they were finally rediscovered in 1480. 17 years later, those were brought back to Naples, and those are the relics that currently reside in the Duomo di Napoli. What does that all actually mean? Well, aside from, as I said earlier, the clear importance of San Gennaro, the fact that he was a bishop and was martyred for his faith, plenty of corroborating evidence, and the existence of the hagiographies means we can safely say that, yes, very important guy, his relics would be totally, totally important. Big guy. Big guy? Actually, the tour guide at the San Gennaro catacombs told us he was probably quite tall, which was evidence that he was probably not Italian, because Italian people were smaller. <laughs> Again, no corroborating evidence for that. It's just what the tour guide told us, but I thought it was kind of interesting. <laughs> With regards to the relics, and especially his blood, which is mentioned the least frequently in all these old records, we have virtually no evidence, no hard evidence, to suggest that this is really his blood, his bones that we have stored. There was a chronicle of Naples in 1382 that mentioned the cult of San Gennaro, didn't make any mention of his blood or the miracle, Ultimately, as is often the case with religious relics, it comes down to a matter of faith. You either have faith that this is really San Gennaro's blood, bones, etc., or you don't. That brings us to important question number two. Is this blood really miraculous? Let me describe the actual ritual for you real quick. On those three dates that I mentioned earlier, the ampules of blood, along with the other relics of San Gennaro, are taken on a procession. I don't know why I did this, because that is not how a procession goes, it is not bishops doing this, but it would be cool if it was. <laughs> They're taken on a procession to the Monastery of Santa Chiara. Ooh, I wonder if the microphone picked up that cracking of my knee just then. The Archbishop then holds up 
the reliquary, which is a word that I'm really struggling with, to show that it is still solidified, except for the occasions when it has already liquefied, but we don't talk about those. Then the faithful who are gathered, including a group of people designated as Sanjanara's relatives, who probably aren't, I don't really get that, it's kind of weird, but it's fine, they're his pretend relatives. They all pray really intensely until the vial liquefies. Sometimes it happens immediately, sometimes it can take hours or days, and very occasionally it doesn't happen at all and Naples starts to sweat. I have a fresh coffee. Back to history! The first date that the miracle is actually mentioned is 1389, when the blood was found to have melted. That obviously, is over a millennium after San Gennaro was meant to have died. Which conjures, at least for me, a little bit of a question about the legitimacy of it, but we'll move on. Over the next two centuries, reports, official reports, start popping up about San Gennaro's blood liquefying once, twice, and finally, three times a year. At the time of these first meltings, the assertions being made were that the proximity of San Gennaro's blood to his relics particularly his skull, back in Naples, was what was causing the melting. And that idea held until the 18th century. Now, here's an important, if slightly confusing, point. The Catholic Church does not officially recognise the melting of San Gennaro's blood as a miracle. They do endorse and support it, and they will not allow any testing to be undergone. That was like halfway between undergone and underdone. You know what I'm saying. It's a kind of fun, get-out-of-jail-free position where they're not beholden to scepticism because it's not officially recognised as a miracle. On the other hand, their followers who believe in the miracle are supported. I see you, Catholic Church. You're so sneaky. We do have a little bit of science on our side, however. In 1902, a spectroscopic analysis was performed by a gentleman whose name I will quickly look up. Gennaro Sperindio. This report claimed that the spectrum was consistent with haemoglobin. Blood. Blood. Now that we're getting into the science, I will just remind you that the description will contain links to a whole bunch of sources related to everything I've told you today, so you can check it out for yourselves. I wish not to bullshit you. Another analysis was carried out in 1989 with similar results. However, the legitimacy of those results has been called into question. First of all, these reports were not submitted to any kind of peer-reviewed journal. They were just published privately. And in fact, at least you used to be able to buy a pamphlet from the cathedral shop containing these results. Catholicism and monetization, the cause of the great divide in Christianity. Second thing then, the tests used an old-fashioned prism spectroscope, which is bizarre because modern electronic spectrophotometers were available, and there's no explanation as to why they didn't use those. Finally, the authors themselves admitted that other red dyes could be mistaken for haemoglobin. Essentially what those reports did was bring us full circle to the beginning, where it was like, yeah, this could be blood, or it might not be. Fucking brilliant. <laughs> there are several more, slightly more complicated scientific reasons to doubt those experiments. I am not a scientist, so I will butcher them and misexplain, and it'll be a disaster. So if you are interested in the finer scientific details, go and check out the report, it'll be linked in the description. Although if you are a science person, if you think you can explain in a way that an idiot like me could understand those other finer points, drop them in the comments, that would be so useful. The main problem we have with the miracle of San Gennaro's blood is this. Coagulated, clotted blood can be mechanically broken down, i.e. mechanically by, by movement, into a more liquid form. It cannot then re-clot. Rather than the liquidizing aspect, it should be the re-coagulating that is the actual miracle here. A few different suggestions have been put forward as to what is actually happening here. One is that this is simply a liquid with a low melting point, the idea being that it would liquefy more when handled, held up in front of a group of hot people near candles, things like that. That hypothesis was recorded as early as 1826 and gained a lot of popularity. However, mixtures of that kind have a consistent melting point, whereas this blood ritual, blood ritual makes it sound way creepier, kinda like it. This ritual is performed at three different times of year three different room temperatures. Furthermore, that idea was more popular when there were a lot of candles brought near the relic. That doesn't really happen anymore. The most plausible hypothesis for what is causing this recoagulation and liquidization is thixotropy. Thixotropy is the property of certain gels to become more liquidy when mechanically disturbed. That's being shaken, picked up, shown around, 
as is the case with the relic. The very handling of the liquid, the taking it out of the relic case, leading it on a procession, showing it up to a crowd, could be what is actually causing the liquidization. This would also explain the liquidizing that occurs at unexpected moments. The blood hasn't only liquidized at these specific times of year when the ritual of prayer is performed, it's happened unexpectedly when it's been removed from the relic case for cleaning and maintenance. Maybe San Gennaro's soul gets confused, he feels a disturbance in the case and is like, oh, get to liquidizing, and then is like, oh, oopsie, it's not time yet. <laughs> I think the thixotropic hypothesis is possibly slightly more likely than that. It's up to you. A study was undertaken in 1991 to test this theory. Scientists made up samples that had properties similar to that of the relic. They also only used substances that would have been available in the 14th century, when the miracle was first being reported. After some trial and error, they settled on a particular solution, I will leave the name of it down here because I'm not going to try and say it. I don't want to embarrass myself any further today, thank you. I'll put some pictures up on the screen so you can see. The gel was the exact shade of reddish brown without the use of any dyes. When shaken, it became perfectly liquid but could also still have some of the other properties that were noted in the actual relic, such as bubbling. Here's the most interesting part to me. One of the compounds, again, I'll put it on the screen, could only be sourced from one particular mineral at the time, that is molossite, which occurs naturally only near active volcanoes. What is Naples famous for? Vesuvio, baby! I'm even wearing Vesuvius lava rock right now. So is the liquidizing of this particular substance miraculous? The answer again is probably not, but it comes down to faith. Unless the Catholic Church permits some kind of testing, they won't allow anything that involves breaking open the glass for fear of damage to the relics, which you can kind of understand. Unless those kinds of tests are ever permitted, we will never know for certain. And it uses compounds readily available at the time that the miracle started occurring in the late 1300s. That plus the lack of evidence, the lack of historical record about the preserving of San Gennaro's blood, leads me to believe that this kind of mixture is far more likely. Ultimately, we will never know, which is a very good position for the Catholic Church to be in. It comes down to a matter of faith. What we can say is that San Gennaro and his relics are very, very important to religious people in Napoli. In my opinion, it is not unreasonable for the faithful to believe in this miracle, and if you look at the history of Naples, and the history of Christianity at the time where it was being persecuted by the Roman Empire, there are many, many cultural reasons that influence the importance of this kind of ritual. I hope you enjoyed that little dive into some history and a little bit of science. I thought it was really fun. I had such, such a good time in Napoli. It really is just layers and layers of fascinating history. I almost get the impression that the history is extra important because while it is such a very old city with such an ancient history and all of these fascinating layers of history, so much of that physical history was lost to bombs in the war. Preserving that knowledge feels even more important as a result. There was something a different tour guide said when I was in in uh, Castel Nuovo, which is one of several castles uh, in Napoli, one by the sea. She was trying to explain, along with explaining why the football is so important, Naples only has one football team. They had just won uh, a certain league for the first time in like 33 years, so the city was in uproar. It was a, The atmos atmosphere was amazing. She was trying to explain that when, uh, well, where you're from, you either like football or you don't, in Naples, when the football team wins, the whole city wins. Likewise, she was trying to explain that, that if you want to understand the art and history of Italy, you have to go to their churches. She said, put the faith aside, that's a separate thing. Our history, our art is in our churches. And it's so true. Coming from a very agnostic country with a very tame Church of England atmosphere to somewhere like Naples, where someone politely asks you, to visit the chapel of San Gennaro and say a prayer for the people of Naples because that means a lot to them is very strange and different and something I find really, really fascinating. I enjoyed it so much. I can't recommend a visit enough. It, it really is wonderful. Like most huge cities, it's got its problems, but much of it is really nice. And the pizza is fucking phenomenal. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Do leave your thoughts down below. If you liked this video, consider giving it a cheeky like and hitting the little subscribe button. It makes me very happy when number goes up. You can see more skeptic themed content, religious history on this channel. I have playlists galore for that kind of thing. There is a chill vibes video of my time in Naples on my extra channel, so please do check that out if you're interested. And remember, Baffy plushes are going on sale next month. Check the description for a link for email notifications. 
I'm going to let go of your head now. All the information on that coming soon. I'm so excited. I can't express to you how excited I am about this plushie launch. I get to launch a plushie. I'm so happy. If you're into gaming stuff, consider giving my YouTube gaming channel a little look-see. We're playing Peppa Pig right now. You don't want to miss it. I am also live three times a week, at least once I'm back from holiday mode. I'm building a new computer right now. It's going to revolutionize the streaming experience, I hope. Check my Twitch for the schedule. I'll be live three times a week, playing goofy games and spooky games and all sorts of games. It's very cool. I don't know why I'm doing this. I've forgotten how to end a video. Before we go, that's it. Before we go, I must give a big thank you to my giant chickens and colossal quackers over on Patreon. <laughs> And if you want uh, silly emotes and uh, uh, comment priority, I will look at your comments all, all, all the time. You can become a channel member. Thank you very much. Have yourselves a very lovely week, and I will see you really soon. Mm -hmm.